Yo, what's going on? This is your boy Zachary Carroll, and unfortunately, I did a live yesterday. Today's Saturday, September 17th, and I did a live September 16th, but you couldn't hear the video. The videos I was reacting to didn't go through the system, so I had to delete it. So now I gotta redo it, and I have to repost it, but we ain't gonna let that stop us. We're here to apply the Bible to all of the world. We're here to put Jesus back in your life, back in your heart, back in your mind, your eyes. We are here to let you know that this is the way to go. And we're gonna be reacting to some TikToks. Now, TikTok is a crazy platform where people go and spit the most ridiculous arguments on a plethora of topics. And so you know your boy had to get on there and talk about Jesus. We're gonna see if they are making good points or not good points. But either way it goes, Jesus will be glorified. Oh, my name is not Zachary Carroll. So check this out. Let's go ahead and share my screen here. Ex-Christians out there, what was the turning point for you? I'll go first. I almost didn't talk about this one, but it was a big deal. For me, the biggest turning point out of hundreds was a few years ago when my twin sister's child came out as trans and said, don't call me Graham, call me Tina. And my mother tried to get my sister's kids to go out to visit her for the summer in BC so she could put them in Christian conversion uh, counseling. Looked at uh, this kid in the face and said, you can do whatever you want, but I will always call you Graham. And I watched the sadness on Tina's face. But yes. yesterday I had a conversation with my mom. My oldest sister's oldest child also came out as trans. No longer Alyssa, he is now Alex. And in a conversation with my mom yesterday, for the first time, my mom said he and used the name Alex instead of Alyssa. Even Christians can learn. The idea that God made a mistake in making you what you are as regard to your gender is to denounce God's very nature. God doesn't make mistakes. He's all perfect, all knowing. There are no mistakes. Look at nature. Look at everything around us. All of the natural functions that exist in the universe. And how precise everything is. Everything was created and put together and designed in such a way that an infinitesimal amount of difference, everything falls apart. Everything. So out of all of that precision, the fact that you were born as a specific gender is not a mistake. It's precise. God precisely wanted you to be what you are. He formed you in the womb. Psalm 139, 13. You knitted us together in our mother's womb. God knitted us together in our mother's womb. He crafted us carefully beautifully and wonderfully. God doesn't make mistakes. There, what was the turning point for you? Honestly, there were many, but I haven't thought about this one for a few years until this popped up in my For You page. So you already know that I was raised by deeply conservative cult-like Jehovah's Witness people. And Jehovah's Witnesses have this thing called an annual convention. For those who need any context, a quick synopsis of it is that it's basically an event where Jehovah's Witnesses from different kingdom halls go to basically mingle with each other in fellowship. Now for background, I was about 10, almost 11, and my female friend that I hadn't seen for like three years, I think she was about to turn like 13. She was a late bloomer and I highly doubt she had even had her first period yet and she didn't even have breasts. 
we were really excited and we platonically ran up to hug each other and everybody kind of looked at us like we were monsters and horrible people. I got chastised by my parents, she got chastised by her parents and probably even worse because she was the girl. It was a moment where I realized hypocrisy in action. A lot of Christians have so much to say about platonic girl and boyfriends, but nothing to say about molestation and rape. All my ex- Yeah, that's true. But Jehovah's Witnesses, I mean, they're they're basically a cult. Yeah, they're it's it's not Christianity. It's not biblical Christianity. They detract far from very fundamental principles. And then they harp on things that they're legalistic on things that don't matter. Like not celebrating birthdays and being so incredibly strict, like uh, a child of opposite genders hugging. I mean, not being able to watch certain movies. I mean, it goes crazy. It goes really, really deep. Now, there are some overlaps to biblical Christianity and Jehovah's Witness. But, I mean, they don't even read the Bible. They read the Watchtower, which is a magazine. Like, I guarantee you, you talk to any Jehovah's Witness, they're going to give you a magazine before they give you the Bible. Yes, I'm sure that's going to upset some people, but it is the truth. Research. Christians out there, what was the turning point for you? I'll go first. Um, yeah, my turning point was when... I tried to tell my parents that the Bible verses they were using to shame the LGBTQ plus community have actually been mistranslated on purpose throughout time to control people. And they got mad at me and shamed me and sat me on the couch for like three hours and interrogated me, asking me like who of my friends were gay and where I was getting ideas that being gay was okay. And asked me if I needed to go to conversion therapy. And I was like, no. You know what? I'm good. I'm just going to write it out for the next couple of years. And you know what? I did. And I'm here now. Look at me. I'm happy. And I'm healthy. And I'm not Christian. And I'm gay. So. All my ex- Okay. So. Uh, the argument is. When Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, that basically fornicators, people who practice homosexuality, liars, uh, basically people who dwell in uh, moral sins will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. And the argument is, the progressive Christian argument is in like 1925, the term homosexual was added to the Bible. And if you go to certain like older translations or certain foreign translations, it's more about child molestation rather than like a man sleeping with another man, which doesn't hold up when you compare that one scripture to where the Bible also talks about it. So if there is a conceived inconsistency with one scripture with another, I guarantee you, you just don't have the proper understanding of that scripture. First Corinthians six, nine, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but were washed, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. So the, the term in question is homosexuality. This term was invented in the early 1920s, in the 1900s, uh, and it does not mean what we all think it means. So the term homosexuality, this is the exegetical guide. So we're breaking down all the word. So homosexuality, arsenokoitai, or arsenokutes. 
arsenokites, sodomite. A male who commits sodomy with another male, sometimes of the active participant exclusively as opposed to passive. And so sometimes people, uh, some translations talk about like molestation, like a man molesting a young boy. And so this term homosexual or homosexuality was created in the early 1900s and it didn't exist and it wasn't was it was not what Paul was talking about. But that does not flow in light of the other scriptures that we have. OK, so when there is a perceived inconsistency with a scripture and then the Bible talks about that same topic in another instance or in other places, you should take each instance that the Bible mentions or talks about or lays out a specific concept before you say, oh, OK, this is an inconsistency. This is wrong. Let the Bible interpret the Bible. So if here you're confused, I'm not confused, but you might be confused where the word homosexuality was created in the early 1900s. So the question really is, is this what Paul's talking about? Like, is Paul talking about something different? And if he is, why do all of the modern translations use this term to mean a man who is practicing homosexuality. So where does the Bible also talk about this? Because Leviticus 18, 22, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. All right. So this is the scripture that also talks about it. Now, the question is, Moses, who wrote Leviticus, is he also using this word that was supposedly created in early 1900s. So if we go to our exegetical guide, so you shall not lie. You shall not lie with male as with a woman. It is an abomination. When we look at the exegetical guide, which breaks down each of the Greek words that were used to be translated, the word, uh, the the word for homosexual is not here. So it's a further description of men sleeping with men. You shall not lie with a male, like a male man. It's up here. It's up here. Male, male, male person, male animal, a human person that is a male. Zakar. 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 So it is a male. You should not lie with male as with a woman. Isha. Isha. So there's no term homosexuality. That's one. Now let's go to the next time it's discussed. In Leviticus 20, 13, if a man, if a if a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have considered, uh, committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood is upon them. So also lie with a male as with a woman. There's no term homosexual. So we have two other instances in the Bible that's talking about the practice of homosexuality. And then the third instance, which is why Paul mentioned that in 1 Corinthians 6. Ex-Christians out there, what was the turning point for you? The turning point for me was just oh, me reaching whoa. an age where I was just kind of like, hmm, I really don't believe in any of this. Like, I'm only really going here because my parents kind of made me go. And I was scared because I thought I was going to burden hell for an eternity because I was raised that way. Like, oh, if you don't believe this, you're going to be punished for it. And one morning I ended up telling my... That's the truth. Eventually. My parents like, hey, I don't really believe in any of this. I was just kind of trying to make you guys happy by going, but I just really don't believe in this. And they were like, okay, you don't have to go if you don't want to go. And honestly, that was it. That was it. Of course, they always express how they wish I'll find God and how they think I will find God someday. 
But I am glad they didn't continue to force me to go because I really shouldn't have been forced to go in the first place. To all my. All right. Well, that's a sad story, but I mean, if I have kids and they come to me and say, "Hey, I don't really believe this stuff. I don't want to go to church." It depends. Like, you may not want to clean your room, but. I'm going to make you clean your room. You may not want to do the dishes, but I'm going to make you do the dishes while you live in here. And if you're living in my house, yeah, you're probably going to come to church with me, especially since I'm a pastor. I don't know. I mean, when you move out, I'm not going to force you to go or whatever. I mean, I will be disappointed, but hopefully I will raise my, my household will be, a free place for my children to question their faith and ask, uh, inquire as to the validity of Jesus's resurrection, which is why I'm a Christian because I believe Jesus actually was resurrected and I'm not doing this as tradition or I'm not going through the motions. This is not, this is not like a, this is not just something that I feel like doing. This is the truth. So that's why I'm a believer. And if my children aren't, uh, that is okay. Because at the end of the day, each person must accept the grace of God on their own, which is why I don't believe in baptizing babies because they have no choice. They don't know what's going on. Baptism is called, it's it's a believer's baptism. You, you're bap- you baptize someone when they know what they're doing. They understand why they're doing it. And they freely do it. Nobody is forcing them. Maybe his parents should have presented the gospel in a more uh, relatable way instead of saying, hey, you're going to church because we're going to church and you have to go. I mean, I'm going to allow my children to question their faith and ask me questions. And, you know, I'm going to work with them through issues they have with the faith. But as far as like going to church, like, if you're living in my house, you coming to church with me. Like, that's, I don't know. And then we're going to go to lunch. Like, like you live with me. I feed you. I provide electricity for you. I provide Wi-Fi for you. I provide a bed for you. You probably ain't paying rent. You get to make your choices. You get to make your own choices as a child when you pay rent or when you move out. But when you live in in my house, you're going to do as I see fit, me and my wife. So, I mean, I will force my kids to go to church, but I'm not going to, you can't force anybody to be a Christian. What was the turning point for you? I got to say the turning point for me was when I started asking questions about the Bible to the people around me, and they had absolutely no answers. They would always try diffusing or deflecting the questions that I had. Like, again, as a kid who grew up being incredibly creative and loving science, I would always ask questions like, why does the Bible never mention dinosaurs? Or why doesn't, you know, the Bible ever go into any detail about, you know, why certain things are bad and why certain things aren't? Number one, because the Bible is not a science textbook. Like, I mean, it does say in Psalm 19 that the heavens and the earth speak to the glory of God and how they're created. And Romans 1, that God made his majesty self-evident to us by our lives and what we see and feel and experience secondly why doesn't the bible detail what's right and what's wrong uh that's all the bible does why every sin is considered to be just as bad as each other when it's very obvious that not every sin is as bad as each other when it comes down to it no one could ever possibly answer those questions for me and when i kept asking them and asking them people just kept saying that i had absolutely no faith Then I actually started reading into the Bible and I realized just how narcissistic and fucked up the God of the King James version of the Bible really is. So yeah, that was basically my turning point right then and there. All sin is bad. All sin separates us from God. And in that it is equal. It is equal because it's all leading away from God. 
Now, stealing a pencil, from our human perspective, stealing a pencil is not as bad as murdering somebody. If we have a God perspective of sin, which we should, then all sin is equal. If we have a human perspective of sin, then we make these distinctions all what we think is bad or what we think is worse than something else. But sin, I mean, if you're sinning against somebody else, like if my sin is against you, then yeah, you get to define the terms of what it is. Like if I sinned against you, if I said something to you that you didn't like, or if I did something to you, you didn't appreciate whatever, then you could define those terms. But sin in and of itself is against God. It's against God. It's an offense of God. To all my ex-Christians out there, what was the turning point for you? I'll go first. For me, it was Christian TikTok. No, dead ass. Christian TikTok was the turning point for me. I first came into this app as a Christian and around 2020, I was starting to question my religious beliefs. That's when I started looking into Christian TikTok and that was one of the worst decisions I have ever made. There is so much gaslighting, victim playing, homophobia, misogynistic stuff on there. If you were part of the LGBT community, they wanted you to change. If you had an abortion, they'd shame you for it. If you were a progressive Christian, they'd say you were a fake Christian and you'd still burn in hell. If you were any We need to define these terms like what does he mean by Christian? What does he mean by progressive Christian? Listen. Homosexuality is a sin. Is that the same thing as homophobia? That's what I want to know. You can tell me if I'm going to tell you what the Bible says about homosexuality and that God doesn't want us to do it in the same way that he doesn't want us having sex before marriage even in heterosexual relationships, does that make me homophobic? I don't know. Now, you should say these things to people in a specific way, and you should reason and relate to people. You shouldn't just treat them like they are beneath you. You shouldn't, you shouldn't treat them like you're better than them because the sin that they may be struggling with, you don't struggle with. Now, that's being a hypocrite. And that's what uh, Jesus was teaching against in Matthew 7. And the abortion issue, yeah, God doesn't want us murdering babies. Now, I understand that people have disagreements about how we define what a baby is, what a life is. But it seems pretty common sense to me that life begins at fertilization. And contrary to popular belief, most scientists, 96% of scientists believe that life starts at fertilization. I'll put the link in the description and on the screen. So I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. Now, you probably were not a Christian to begin with. That was really what it is. And that's okay. It's okay not to be a Christian. I mean, it's not okay after you die, but it's okay with me. Well, it's not okay with me. I want you to be a Christian, but I'm not going to shame you if you're not a Christian. I'm going to talk to you, get to know you, see if you're interested in becoming a Christian. And if you're not, then enjoy your life. Christians out there, what was the turning point for you? So mine was the realization that I really did like women and the fact that it was so, you know, being gay was so much a sin um, that I was outed by my sister finding my Tumblr where I openly identified as a lesbian at the time and she immediately showed my parents without even talking to me and then they took me to the pastor to parry the gay away oh, okay. and to Christian counselors. So that was my turning point. Another abuse, someone coming out living as, you know, you're living that homosexual lifestyle and she was betrayed by a family member. And it's like, well, 
a lot of people, a lot of Christians don't know how to deal with the LGBTQ community. They don't. And the church doesn't really do a good job of instructing Christians how to deal with it. First of all, you or I or any church is not going to break anyone free from sin. We don't save people. It's not our responsibility to save them. We are here to tell the truth, tell the good news, spread the good news, tell people what we've seen and heard, our testimony. Tell people the truth, the truth of Jesus. And God is the one that's going to break people free from whatever trap befalls them. Well, I think that's pretty good. Hope you enjoyed that. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. My name is Zachary Carroll, a.k.a. Pastor Z. Y'all be cool.